Thank you very much for being a, for having invited me. I'm delighted to be here, and again, thank you for the introduction. And I'm humbled, and I hope I can deliver. This lecture is indeed held in honor of Salek Mink, a medical practitioner who also published a series of articles on the relationship between medicine and culture. Being a cardiologist, he felt that unresolved emotions suppressed by normed behavior induce tensions which may prompt medical problems such as a heart disease. For him, contemplation and immersion in art could help resolve such tensions. His view may have been influenced by his own life experiences. Similarly to many of those mentioned today, he was a Jewish emigre from the 1930s. According to Sally Quinn, who curated and wrote the catalogue for the exhibition Bauhaus on the Swan, Elise Blumen, an emigre artist on Western Australia, 1938 and 1948, Mink also knew Elise Blumen personally in the 1940s through emigre gatherings in Perth. Born in the Russian town Seidlik, which is today in Poland, in 1905. I've brought you a picture of Salek Mink, which is unfortunately a bit small. <coughs> Mink also knew Elise personally. He was born in 1905, as you can see. Mink studied medicine in Italy, graduating in 1925 to become a specialist physician. In 1935, the same year in which National Socialist Germany introduced the so-called Nuremberg Laws, defining Jews by race and not belief, he left for the UK, where he then joined a tourist vessel as a ship surgeon, arriving in Perth in 1940, where he continued his passion from the 1920s, namely collecting and promoting the arts. It is thanks to him and the kind invitation of Sally Quinn that I have been able to travel from Germany to Perth to be here today and speak about space, place and migration in modern art. So that's the exhibition and the exhibition catalogue for this exhibition in which we are placed. And here, this is what I'm going to talk about. During the 1930s, thousands of refugees left Nazi Germany Many went to Britain, so that London became a heaven for modern art. It was also in London that Circle, an international survey of constructive art, was published, a key book on modern art with contributions from leading avant-garde artists. Edited by Naum Garbo, Ben Nicholson and Leslie Martin, the publication dealt foremost with the topic of space, namely in sculpture, painting, architecture, and also in design. This paper will consider these conceptions of space in the 1930s and ask how such interest was reflective of migrants' experiences of changing places and expanding spaces. It will argue that space was a feature relevant beyond a mere formalist analysis that may stretch to the formulation, as I offer to you, um, which I have term termed provisionally a spatial art history. And I would also like to say that <clears throat> it is wonderful to be actually able to held this, um, this paper in uh, the gallery space. So what you can experience here is um, not only um, 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 Elisa Blumen's visual work, but also might um, be reminded of her accent, because obviously um, she, bought, she came from Germany and therefore um, might have had a similar kind of accent. I'm trying to speak slowly so you can all understand me. But therefore you have not just only a visually enjoyable work, but probably also a reminder uh, in terms of the orality. That is usually and sometimes forgotten um, when you think about emigres. New media and global experiences have arguably brought discussions on spatial conceptions to the fore. These have even led to creating a sub-discipline of sociology known as the sociology of space. At its beginning stood Henry Lefebvre's seminal book, The Social Production of Space, which is cited as being fundamental for the so-called spatial turn in the 1990s, when the geographer Edward Sodger revived Lefebvre. What followed was a generation of academics who conceived of space as neither simply natural geography, nor an empty container filled by history, but being produced by subjects 
Furthermore, they believe that space, whether mathematical, mental or physical, is never devoid of social relations. This fundamental change towards space has brought forward further theories. In history, the different approach to space found its expression in transfer-oriented reflections of multi-perspective transnational history writing, as these reproduce an a priori understanding of their object of research. They became known, they became known as Transfergeschichte by Michel Espagne, Histoire Croisée by Benedict Zimmermann and Michael Werner, and Entangled History. In art history, space has mainly been considered as a topic in artworks and less as a method of or with space, so there seems to be an increase, increasing interest. After having agreed on speaking today, which was I think in April, an advertisement of the Art Association of Australia and New Zealand reached me through the global network Artistnet, announcing that their forthcoming and annual conference at Brisbane, Queensland, on the 24th and 25th of October 2015, will be held on the topic of image, space, body. Hence, I feel that this topic is not only timely, as is that of migration and art in the 1930s, when considering not only the Elise Blumen show here, but also two exhibitions currently held in London, namely the retrospective of Barbara Hepworth at Tate Britain and the centen centenary exhibition of the Ben Uri Gallery, the London Jewish Gallery, which had a close relationship with emigres from continental Europe during its existence. Furthermore, as will come to light in this paper, spatial conceptions were already developed by artists in the interwar years. Inspired by recent literature on space, I will suggest and question as to whether these historical spatial conceptions, particularly the most influential one of the so-called open and closed space, proposed by Naum Garbo, can be developed into a method with which to approach any art object, which I have provisionally labelled spatial art history. Conceptions of space also played a vital role in the interwar years, as I've just mentioned. One of the most influential ones in 1930s Britain was that of Naum Garbo, who distinguished a so-called open form from a so-called open from a closed form of space. This distinction seems to go beyond a mere reference to space as a topic or formalist element, implying a fundamental difference in how to view the world. Although Garbo may well be one of the first to do so, he was not the only one. His conception of closed and open space is similar to the distinction made in theories related to the spatial turn, which speaks of container versus absolute space. One can also find non-essentialist and essentialist approaches as a distinction of open and closed forms. Even the Oxford English Dictionary defines space in these two ways, namely as a continuous extension viewed with or without reference to the existence of objects within it, or as the interval between points or objects viewed as having one, two or three dimensions. Hence, while I'm far from claiming that Garbo is the only one who saw this distinction, his explanation underpinned by a model is most helpful in understanding the differentiation possibly because, being an artist, he visualizes the differences in several sculptures that I will introduce to you. <coughs> Naum Garbo has become known as the author of the so-called Realistic Manifesto, published in 1920. This manifesto was co-signed by his painter brother, Nicolas Pevsner, and is widely considered the key text for constructivism, a modern art movement for which space plays a central role. Conventionally, constructivism has been divided into realists using real space and the idealists using ideated space. The latter is being identified with Garbo, as well as his brother Pevsner, Russian artists who lived and propagated constructivism in the West, while the former refers to Vladimir Tatlin and his constructivist colleagues who stayed in Russia after it became the Soviet Union, under which their art became more utilitarian, supporting Stalin's Marxism, Leninism. While space already plays a dominant role in, his, in this manifesto, Garbo continued working on the topic so that it became the main focus of his paper, translated as the problems of space and time and their falsification, written five years after the realistic manifesto in 1925. 
most likely being influenced by living in Berlin at the time, Gabo draws attention to the meaning of the term Raum, or space, in German. And I quote, There is space to designate the cosmos and space as a closed room, or cell, viewed from within. It is obvious that these two concept concepts have been confused with one another, at least insofar as the second concept is more familiar. For Gabo, both interior design and architecture belong to the latter concept, a space of shaping space. Gabo, however, wants to create space and understand space as conceptually open. What he means becomes clearer in his first theoretical statement in English, published in The Listener in 1936 and entitled Constructive Art. Gabo argues that the vocation of the art of our epoch is not to reproduce nature, but to create and enrich it. In other words, or in my words, art should create nature, not by reproduction, but by producing something anew that enriches nature, which might well be understood as reality or life as such. Essentially different in kind, he uses nature as a model for art. Art should create as nature can create at the same time. While here, nature seems a rather vague term, Garbo's essay entitled Sculpture, Carving and Constructing in Space clarifies the meaning of his open form best because it is introducing the comparison to closed forms. This article appeared in the book mentioned before, namely in Circle, a book edited by him, Leslie Martin and Ben Nicholson and published in 1937. Preceded by a reproduction of two cubes, Garbo refers to them in his essay as illustrating a new principle that should be inserted into sculpture, the so-called, and I quote, the so-called construction in space, which kills the whole essential basis of sculpture as being the art of solid masses. Furthermore, these cubes, today in the Tate collection, helps distinguish what Garbo called open and closed forms of space and, other defined, and, others def and what others defined as space as container or essentialist space as different from absolute and non-essentialist forms from space. In Garbo's own words, the illustration distinguishes between the two kinds of representation of the same object. The first cube represents a volume of mass, and this is your, to, your light, to your left. The second, the one on your right, represents, I have also this lovely pointer, which I hope I work, so here. So there are two kinds of representation of the same object. The first cube yeah, represents volume of mass. The second represents the space in which the mass exists made visible. We consider space from an entirely different point of view. We consider it as an absolute sculptural element released from any closed fort volume, and we represent it from inside with its own specific properties. Garbo interprets space as material, as an absolute sculptural element. In order to be able to comp comprehend space in this way, he must assume that the artist constructs space which was previously inexistent or existent only as absolute. Referring to this in circle as a transcendental idea, he uses a term conventionally associated with the writings of Kant, who received a revival particularly from the 1860s in what has become known as Neo-Kantianism. And I have at a different place shown actually the relationship between Neo-Kantianism and this concept, or Garbo's concept of space. Garbo was not the only artist thinking along these lines of an open concept of space. Apart from Barbara Hepworth and Ben Nicholson, Artists considering this idea from the 1930s and under the influence of Garbo, and I will refer to them later. It was particularly the Bauhaus artists, including Laszlo Moholy-Norsch and Marcel Breuer, who had similar approaches. As examples, I'm showing you here Laszlo Moholy-Norsch's light space modulator, which he completed in 1930, using light in the attempt to create space, and his spirals, which is called spirals, concave and convex forms, made of plexiglass in the 1940s, materials which were also used by Garbo. And there are constructivist artists, such as the aforementioned Vladimir Tatlin, who designed the so-called Monument to the Third International in 1919-1920, a 
a model which is lost but has been recreated for exhibitions. And I'm showing you here the recreation on the top right. Tatlin also designed clothes for the stage, that's probably not so much known. Uh, effect, indeed, which is not so much known, it's shown to you on the right, uh, but, it, um, but demonstrates what I have mentioned before, namely the ut utilitarian approach of constructivism under Stalinism. Indeed, if the focus lies on construction, spatial conceptions run the danger of being misused because space is undetermined. It is no wonder, therefore, that spatial conceptions developed in the 1920s were also used by totalitarian governments. Apart from constructivism, which was instrumentalized under Stalinism, the National Socialists justified Jewish persecution and expansionist politics with the idea of Lebensraum, of living space, while the Italian fascists named it Spatio Vitalia, conceptions of space which, however, rely on a closed, if not enclosed, conceptions of space. The interest in space in the interwar years has got a number of ramifications for migration, the meaning of place, and, taking together with recent developments of spatial theories, for a methodology based on space. Space and migration. One might think that the experience of moving and living in different countries because of being forced out of Nazi Germany may have initiated conceptualizations of space. However, this is clearly not the case. In other words, expansion of place does not initiate necessarily thinking about space. However, by adopting and continuing what emigres such as Garbo and the Bauhaus artists had developed about space in Weimar Germany, migration caused a dissemination that might have otherwise taken longer and might have not been as intensive as in the case of the string sculptures, to which I will turn in a minute. This chance or mission of migration is not only true in light of distance and politics. In other words, the further away from Europe, the more unlikely it would have been for continental modernism to get quickly dispersed and experienced what Sally Quinn called first-hand knowledge of modernism, particularly if there were no political alliances in the form of colonial hegemony. Or, in even other words, emigre from Nazi Germany, such as Elise Blumen, brought a kind of Bauhaus style to Perth, which might have otherwise taken much longer. Furthermore, modernism changed through the Nazis, so even in cases of refugees migrating to nation-states closer to Germany, such as Gabo, Molinos and many others who went to the UK, the modernism of the Weimar Republic was pushed into the underground or completely destroyed in Nazi Germany. In other words, it is thanks to the emigres that modernism and conceptions of space developed in Weimar Republic survived and continued to develop in freedom and without the, pressure, without the pressures typical for art under totalitarian governments. In this sense, artworks and exhibitions that honor emigres were do more than only offering an aesthetic contribution to modernism. They are carrying further the ideas and ideals of an art that may have otherwise not survived, being thus cultural archaeologists who trace and preserve modernism. If migration is the experience of place changing and, and expansion, then one can see that space is not to be misunderstood as place. Indeed, it is conventionally seen as the concretion of space that is rather about an idea. This may also explain that despite that the book included a list, the book circle included a list of exhibitions, some with installation photographs, and had an exhibition on the occasion of the book publication in 1937, none of the contributors to circle reflected on exhibition display issues or location as part of their concepts of space understanding the exhibition as a place and space where they can investigate what they develop for their artworks. This is partly surprising as artists at the same time did consider exhibition display. Most famously Elisitsky in his design of the 1930 exhibition hall in Hanover where Garbo also exhibited. Um, this is destroyed but has been reconstructed and you can see the reconstruction on the right. So the images, what I'm referring to is that the images as such they had, as you can see with the Montreal image on the 
turn right here. The display as such was uh, created so that it was not just a, what one can call a white cube um, display, but actually reflected the, the works as such. And therefore, one could um, consider this as, um, as not just only a, a consideration of display, but also of um, designing really the space. What migration and the reflection on space supports is what Anthony Giddens concluded, namely that modernity, modernity increasingly tears space away from place. In other words, art does less represent place and rather presents space. And indeed, the inclusion of a list of exhibitions on abstract and constructive art this installation photographs may be an indication that, despite not consciously reflecting on exhibition space as place, it does show that space and place were growing apart. Analyzing the artwork seems to be not only an iconography of space, in other words, using space as a topic in their art, because they themselves wrote about it, but amounts into a methodological reflection of their spatial conceptions. It takes its starting point from Garbo's distinction of open and closed space, as outlined in the following. Of course, yeah, of course, Garbo's distinction undoubtedly has its limitations for an application to a method. Therefore, the following also draws upon more recent theories, as mentioned above, which also use similar distinctions, though providing different names for them, such as the aforementioned container developed in social science. In fact, as a retrospective method, open and closed concepts have been distinguished from each other under the terminology of non-essentialist and essentialist approaches towards general jurisprudence, for example by Brian Tamanaha. In the following, I will provide some examples which should also help distinguish the difference between open and closed forms. I will start with Garbo and then move on to Hepworth and Moore, artists who played with open and closed approaches and therefore try to... Um, to, um, to, to, to practice my um, methodology of a spatial art history, of a proposed spatial art history. To be precise, Garbo is only interested in producing open forms of space, whether these are the, his stereometric figures of the 1910s, uh, which you can see here, and I'm, show, I'm showing you also an image um, of the model which is um, um, which is exhibited at, at the Tate, so you get a feeling of the size. <coughs> the stereo, um, whether these are his stereometric figures of the 1910s or his string sculptures of the 1930s, of the 1930s and 1940s. The stereometric figures, called after stereometry, a process in physics to determine the volume and dimensions of solids, are built similar to the cube. And I think that should come now, sorry. Yeah to the cube, representing the open form of space. It has a center that opens up, making visible space as open, and thus disproving volume as only consisting of solids. Garbo's string sculptures offer the possibility to distinguish between open and closed forms of space and representation, because it was not only him, but also Barbara Hepworth who produced such string sculptures. And I'm showing you here her sculpture with color deep blue and red, which is also included in the current exhibition at the Tate. <clears throat> While Garbo exploited the strings in a way that opens up, um, particularly through the center that is left open, and I'm referring to this center, um, Hepworth uses strings in order to make visible yeah, yeah, you can see that. Hepworth uses strings in order to make visible the inner side of the sculpture, this here. So there is no hole. And therefore, in other words, she shows the volume of space and, similar to the cube, represents it as closed. Thus, despite very similar artworks, the spatial concept behind is different and leads thus to a different interpretation. Hepworth's sculpture offer an excellent example to demonstrate the concept of open and closed space. While in the sculpture just shown, she used space as closed, other works demonstrate an open concept of space. According to Hepworth's biographer, the artist's pierced form was a significant breakthrough. 
Indeed, the sculptures herself, the sculptures herself records in 1952 that she, and I quote, pierced the stone in order to make an abstract form of space. Intriguingly, she refers here to form and space as two equivalents. Wilkinson is quite right in arguing that Hepos has made what he called holes before pierced form. She had carved, and I quote him, she had carved through the stone, but these opened out areas simply defined the naturalistic space between the arms and the body. The difference to pierced form is that the so-called hole in pierced form is part of an abstract piece and is such an integral part of the sculpture. The term hole is a description that assumes that the sculpture has taken away mass, creating a hole into the mass. This is different to space as material, used to create a feature of the sculpture. The latter assumes that space is material yeah, and can be uh, used similar, um, therefore, um, the latter assumes that space is material and can be used similarly to any other material. Therefore, the hole in pierced form is a wrong description and might be better described as an open form in order to show that Hepworth, like Garbo, interpreted space as material. Garbo, different from Hepworth, who attaches the same value to mass and space, however, Garbo conceives of space as an absolute sculptural element and that a construction with space as material changes the essential idea of sculpture. A sculpture is no longer solid, not made of mass, but space is the material of which mass is made. But here I'm showing you this example because as a comparison with Henry Moore, where space is, is produced or is actually part in order yeah, to indicate actually that this is the arm, yeah, whereas this is obviously not. This means that these concepts of space are different from many other understandings of space. They are not, as has been claimed by Wilkins, Wilkinson for Hepworth, concerned with negative space, another form of space of which the most prominent artist is the contemporary Rachel Whitebread. Um, yeah, yes, whether you call it open or a hole, and I have suggested that you call that actually rather open than um, a hole. And this is the artwork by Rachel Whitebread, untitled, Six Spaces, that is uh, usually associated with negative space because it actually shows with, it consists of resin with which she shows the spaces underneath six chairs, making visible the space left out by the chairs. As you can see here, these are this would be the the chairs would be here on top, so that's the left out space or negative space. So open space and uh, closed open space is not the same as um, negative space. As shown above, a spatial art history will consider how an artwork conceptualizes space. This cannot only be applied to artists who mention the topic of space, but to any artwork, a space, according to Kant, is an a priori category. Thus, everything has a spatial aspect. Such an approach reflects the assumption that space is not just given, but constructed, and thus this would include the assumption that space can be conceptualized in different ways. Space treated as a topic has been done before, such as, for example, in the contributions to a catalogue which was entitled Topos Raum, Topos Space, which I also have mentioned earlier. However, just looking at a topic does not constitute a methodology. What needs to be revealed is the respective conceptions of space and its drivers, and thus to make conceptions of space into a cultural history of space. In terms of pictures, an open approach offers several layers of possibilities. On the one hand, such an approach could consider a picture like a sculpture. Namely, as a three-dimensional art object, may this be a painting, a drawing, or any in reality constructed image. On the other, it also creates an imaginative space by transforming a two-dimensional canvas or piece of paper, and I'm showing you just as an example, the School of Athens, into the illusion of being a three-dimensional space through the invention of perspective. And here you can see the vanishing points that refer, actually, that go back to Plato and um, Aristotle in the middle. But this is um, producing, through the vanishing point, producing actually an illusion of a three-dimensional space. 
Already Panofsky has considered the perspective not only as a medium, which enables the construction of an imaginative three-dimensional space, but as a cultural phenomenon of wider significance. Perspective can either demonstrate how space was considered, namely from the perception of one eye, which is yours looking there, based, um, and this would be based on the assumption of Euclidean geometry. It further signals a point in history which divided the body from space, Perspective is only possible if the body, and with it the eye, are outside the imagined space of a picture in which the perspective takes place, a topic which I will outline further down. A spatial approach would result in writing a different kind of art history. Similar to the essays in space, in this book of 2007, um, a book which develops spatial methodologies for a number of disciplines, but not for art history, not in the same way as I do, one cannot consider modern art, one can consider modern art as challenging the conceptions of a container space or closed space, as prevalent since around 1600, that's the invention of perspective, and getting disputed particularly during the 20th century. Art techniques such as montage, collage and assemblage draw attention to the fragmentation of a closed space understanding. Artworks of the second half of the 20th century, such as the massive installation by Richard Serra, or land art by Robert Smithson, are suggestions of an expansion of the closed space and attempts to break away while net art exploiting hyperspace regarding hyperlinks or its equivalent the hyperimage. Apps and social networks, to name a few, mobilize a complete new way of realizing open space, and I'm showing you here an example of one of the first artists who produced such um, net art, which is Tomoko Takahashi, and she, her work is visible on www.e2.org, which is uh, one of the first um, um, in, um, well, associations that made available such net art for a longer, on a longer basis. <coughs> open and closed forms of space define the perspective, namely how humans situate themselves in view of objects. This is also the reason why theories related to the spatial turn have been developed, particularly in sociology. It also indicates the difference to formalism, which is only concerned with space as a formal aspect, but not in relation to any human being. Thus, I am interested primarily in two questions in the cons when I draft the spatial art history. Who acts? And how are these actors, in inverted commas, represented in relation to the artworks? What Garbo has only vaguely thought out, namely the proximity of art and life, is developed more clearly in spatial methods on the body and embodiment. The body, meaning here the artist, can be seen as the actor or the mediator regarding space. As actor, the artist creates the space by being an artist. As mediator, the object becomes the subject that creates the space. This would mean that the artist is not an artist per se, but only through creating art, object, uh, only through creating art object is the person becoming an artist. So what you do is defining you, rather than the other way around. Thus, in an open space approach, the focus moves from the person to the object as the subject and actor of constructing space. Outlining the second questions as to how body and space relate in artworks, let me begin by analyzing a painting by one of the artists who were influenced by Naum Babu, namely Ben Nicholson, in order to explain how the body and embodiment can be explored in a spatial art history. Ben Nicholson, an abstract English painter, was in close contact with Garbo. In fact, it was him who helped it was him who helped Garbo immigrate to Britain, and it was also he who um, edited Circle in 1937. Being influenced, he, he reinterpreted his work, Usha Beauté, the one I'm showing you here, painted in Deeper in France in 1932, as a representation of a shop on planes in 1941. So despite having it painted in 1932, he actually changed its interpretation, and that's the one I'm going to cite. The name of the shop was Usha Beauté, the words themselves had also an abstract quality. 
But what was important was that this name was printed in very lovely red lettering on the glass window, giving one play, and I should probably show you this. Here, yeah, Ushak put. Um, on the glass window, giving one plane, and in this window were reflections of what was behind me as I looked in, giving a second space, and that's what there is. While through the window objects on a table were performing a kind of ballet and forming the eye or life point of the painting, giving a third plane, and that's also there. These three planes and all their subsidiary planes were interchangeable so that you could not tell which was real and which was unreal, what was reflected and what was unreflected. And this created, as I see now, some kind of space or an imaginative world in which one could live. Nicholson's experience is fundamentally a spatial one, an experience of depth through the layering and intersecting of different planes. It is very similar to the cubist's idea of space, for whom all space is composed of infinite planes which intersect in all directions. However, different from this, Nicholson experienced himself in between, as part of the space, by including the reflection behind him. Also to explain that, um, you have the shop window, you have, so to speak, what is in that shop window, but you also have the reflection what is in front. However, different from this, Nicholson experienced himself in between, as part of the space, by including the reflection behind him. In this sense, his so-called space construction, that's what he titled, or what he wrote about in 1941, is different from Cubism and from Garbo, for whom space is constructed by the artist, but does not really let the artist be part of his construction of space, apart from creating it. Hence, Nicholson's work cleverly overcomes the split between represented space and body by including the fewer spectator or person in front of the work. However, as the spectator or artist who stands in the painting is actually not made visible in the work, so you don't see Nicholson, the artist, he is neither painted as, for example, is the couple represented in the mirror Sorry, that was the wrong. Yeah. Um, so, um, so it's not made visible in the work. He's neither painted, as for example, in, is the couple represented in the mirror and thus and thus assumed here yeah, that one and thus assumed yeah to stand um, in front of the painting in Velázquez's famous painting Las Meninas, 1656, nor in any way reflected, as for example. Postmodern works do with mirrors that play on self-reflexivity, making each spectator the artist, as in the work here by Anish Kapoor. While these works represent the body within the space of the artwork, so in very different ways, Nicholson leaves the viewer or spectator imagined. Including the spectator in paintings or sculptures is simulating what can be experienced in architecture, but also by modern architectural design, such as the Merzborn by Schwitters, described by Werner Hofmann in his contribution to Space, um, the book Raum Orte der Kunst, Space, uh, places, uh, spa places of Art, as uh, Schlupfwinkelräume, uh, namely as a walk-in structure of concave and convex forms, which let the body be part of the artwork. Regarding the spectator, we have to distinguish between the one imagined and painted and the one standing in front of the objects like you, looking at this. If created, in other words, if assuming an open space, the viewer would stand outside any space. He or she would create that space. In this sense, the viewer spectator is recognized in the same way as artists themselves, namely as creator or producer of spaces or space. Applying the suggested spatial method to Blumen, we find a treatment of space in view of the spectator different from Nicholson. And this is also to try out my theory. Her work excludes the spectator. That's different from Ben Nicholson. That was the Merzbahn, I've mentioned before. And here, this is an image which you can see in the next room. Applying the suggested spatial method to Blumen, we find a treatment of space in view of the spectator different from Nicholson. 
Her work excludes the spectator. In both her landscape painting and portraits, the spectator is outside the painting space. Blumen constructs layers of space in the painting by representing different planes, usually consisting either of a selection of the following or all, namely sky, mountains, water, or sea, lake, river, and land, beach, riverside, such as in the portrait of Phyllis Quans, in which the sitter is set against the Swan River, the portrait being the artist's first representation of the Austrian landscape, according to Sally Quinn. She does, however, play, that means um, Blumen, play with the scale of these planes in order to achieve a kind of perspective and to put emphasis on the portrait, whether this is a figure or a tree, uh, in her landscape painting, which you see, on, which is uh, the painting over there. When you turn your head, you can see the original. <coughs> So she does play with it, whether this is a figure or a tree in her landscape painting. Hence, her landscapes seem to be actually portraits of trees, painterly treating nature in the same way as a human being. Regarding space, she constructs a space in which the spectator is outside the painted spaces and thus creates, with the artist, a container space, different from that by Nicholson. However, the dominance of the painted figure and trees in the work over there, seems as if the figures would pop out of the painted space, seemingly blowing up the space in order to be experienced as immediate. To summarize, by providing an analysis of selected artworks, I have attempted to describe a constructive framework of a, spatial, of a proposed spatial art history based on an open conception of space. It would analyze space as a topic, if applicable, a reflection of the positioning of the figure regarding space in artworks and by interpreting the imagination of the spectator, use space to define a cultural history. So what this paper wants to demonstrate is that space is not only a central topic today, but has also been so in the 20th century in art and art history. Moreover, combining contemporary theories of space with historical ones developed by artists such as Naum Garbo can lead to a different approach to art that one might be able to distinguish as a method different from other art historical methods, such as semiotics, feminism or connoisseurship, and formalism, by focusing not only on the topic of space in art, but also by revealing the conceptions of art behind the artwork, and as a third point, explore how spaces are constituted by embodiment. As mentioned at the beginning, the concept of closed and open space has found a number of developments in other disciplines under differing names. Indeed, if one were to use such a method for art, as I have tried to show you, one would not only be able to claim this flüger that space is a fundamental topic in modern art, but also that modernity introduced and challenged the concept of container space, the latter particularly in writings of the 19th and 20th centuries. Modern art, conventionally beginning with Impressionism, might then be described as the struggle for breaking down space as container and the search for new conceptions of space, such as the one described in this paper, and not only as contesting the representation or better reconstruction of reality or simply filling the canvas. Defining modernity as the period of a struggle with a closed concept of space also corresponds with Hartmut Rosa's understanding of modernity as the time for which acceleration was characteristic, which I would also suggest is based on a container understanding of time. But he has this theory that modernity is the time of, uh, of which acceleration was characteristic. I can give you an, an easy example. If uh, Blumen took I think four to six weeks in the 1930s to come to Perth. It took me about 13 hours to fly. So this is part what Hartmut Rosas called um, a typical characteristic of modernity, this kind of acceleration, and he proves that in different areas. Going beyond postmodernism's condition, which proclaimed simultaneity, Iota, for example, and thus emphasizing rather temporal than spatial issues, one might describe the period after modernity or postmodernism as one which in as one which in which space concepts, particularly open space concepts, have become the dominant feature that also allowed forming new relationships with approaches that one might consider are historical. Discussions with specialists on the medieval philosopher Meister Eckhart 
um, who is, was born in um, Erfurt, where I'm um, holding my fellowship at the moment. Um, and, and there's a research center at the Max Weber Center and discussing that with the medieval philosopher Meister Eckhart, uh, with, sorry, with the, with the specialist um, for Meister Eckhart, have indicated to me that Eckhart's writing is underpinned by a non categorical concept of space. In other words, during the Middle Ages, they have different concepts of space. That is more kind of open one that I suggest. It, this actually, this kind of discussion uh, actually motivated us to organize uh, an exhibition titled Performing Space that will show contemporary video art which interprets space and time in Meister Eckhart at Erfurt's contemporary art gallery called Weitspeicher from January to March in 2016. Assuming that modernity can be understood as plural, historically not bound to a certain time period or to a specific geographical location, one would need to do further research as to how specific and characteristic such a container understanding of space as a characteristic of modernity might be. Thank you very much for being able to present this to you and I would be pleased to get any kind of questions and to challenge what I have tried to show you, namely space, place and migration in modern art.